Life is a journey and each of our paths is different. Sometimes we feel like we're just out for a stroll and other times we walk with purpose. There are even days when our road seems treacherous. Have you ever wondered what it might have been like for Jesus to walk the road to the cross and how that impacts us? The road. So when I was about 17, 18 years old, I was about your age, Caitlin. Uh, my dad had convinced, the, had had a talk with the road service, the, the state road crew. They'd done all their work on the highway and they'd left, you know, they cleared the gravel out, but there's always that little layer that's just left there that if you scrape real hard, you can get. He'd talk to them about allowing us to use that gravel. And so they said, sure. So he borrowed a dump truck from one uh, rice farmer who was in the area and he borrowed a, a backhoe from another one. And we were going to gravel our quarter mile driveway and 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 as part of it we were also going to haul some truckloads to to this farmer that had the that had the dump truck and over to this guy that loaned us the 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 backhoe and and there was no consideration that I had never driven a truck that big I mean it it was only two miles or so I mean it had farm tags on it it didn't matter that I didn't have a CDL uh, now, you also have to realize that, that if you're coming from the freeway, going to my parents' house, um, where they still live now, it, it's a, it's a two-lane country road, you know, one of those that, that doesn't have a stripe down it so that when you pass somebody, you kind of have to get over on the shoulder. And it, that's where the second lane is. As long as both tires are on the shoulder, you got two lanes, right? And they live, and, and they live in the middle of this curve. So you're headed, and it's, a, and it's this left-hand turn, and it's a pretty good berm, and their driveway goes right out of the middle of it. Are you getting the picture? You can't see the driveway. And so I've got this dump truck, and I have to pull around the corner and back up over the hilltop into the driveway and then go down. First few times, I was doing pretty good. Then I started getting cocky. Do a little faster. Do a little faster. And it wasn't too long before I missed the driveway totally. And I had the dump truck high center on that edge of the road there with the ditch. Dad's two miles away. And we don't have anything that will pull that sucker off out. And I'm standing there mad at myself, kicking myself, just having a, not having a good time, not having a good day at that point. And one of the other farmers comes driving by and he rolls down his window and he goes, get in, son. Let's go down the street and let's get one of my big tractors. We'll get you out of there. And I was mad. I don't know what I said to him. I was frustrated. We're rolling down the road. But I remember he's the first person ever told me this. And he said to me, he said, the only way to not mistake, make mistakes is to do nothing. So get over it and move on. Well, well. So today, we're going to kind of talk about that truth as we wrap up the road series today. As we talk about the road less traveled. Yeah. Mistakes, missteps, problems, challenges, they're part of life. They, they just are. But if we're not careful, what happens is we'll let those things pile up and pile up and pile up and, begin not, and become an anchor and even in some cases define who we are. Today we want to talk about how do we overcome those things so that they don't bog us down. John Maxwell has a book that, that uh, in my opinion, every high school senior should read. I need to get you a copy. <clears throat> it's called Failing Forward. But I love the, the, the subtitle because the subtitle says this, turning our failures into stepping stones for success. Oh, I love that. But, you know, guys, if we're not careful, how many, we know, I mean, you probably know someone who, who their past, their, their problems, their mistakes, they, they let it become the definition of who they are. We get stuck in the struggles, in the uh-ohs. 
question is, how do you get over it? Well, that's what we want to talk about today. How do, how do, you, how do you do what the God told me to do? Move on. So that's what we want to talk about. Because I, I know in my years as a believer, as a follower of Jesus, I've seen people who were trying to follow Jesus, and they, and they would have, they would, they would, scrape their knee, they'd fall down, and eventually they go, look, I tried this Jesus thing, and I just can't do it, so they just quit. They just quit on it. Let me tell you something, that the road that is filled with things that have been overcome, that is the road less traveled. That's the road less traveled, the one where we have overcome and kept going anyway, and that's what we want to look at. Before we do that today, I want to say welcome again, and if this is your first time with us and you, we haven't met or you don't know us, my name's Tim Ware. My wife Rachel and I have the privilege of being the lead pastors here at Crossing Place, and we have prayed for you today and asked the Lord to minister to you on the road you're on, right where you're at. And, you know, for, for those of you that <clears throat> maybe, you know, I know weekends are not times that we all check emails and, and everything. And, if you, and as Rachel just mentioned, you know, there is kind of a theme through our team of there's a little weightiness today because of this loss. Uh, but Jesus has got it because this is one more thing we get to overcome. This is one of those things. Let's, let's pray over the rest of our service. Father, <clears throat> you are the overcoming God. Throughout your story that we see in the Bible, again and again, you're, you're helping your people who will choose to follow you to overcome the difficulties, to, to overcome the challenge, to overcome their mistakes and their missteps. And today, Lord, I ask that you help us to overcome and learn how and commit to that in Jesus' name. Amen. This is the last part of last sermon in our in our road series. So this is the last time we get to read this this um, theme verse out loud together. But let's do it. All right, are y'all ready? Here we go. On the count of three, Hebrews twelve two one two three. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Now, if you want to follow along in your Bible or in your, uh, on your app, then would you, do you, want, you can turn to John 21. I had somebody say to me, I want you to know that Don and Howard, they, have y'all noticed that, we've got, that it's a little brighter in here? They've been working on the lights. Uh, I had somebody say, it was nice to be able to read my paper Bible. <laughs> Whatever. Okay. <laughs> For those of you that are not device people, all right? It, we're not making fun of device people. We're not. I have my device, right? Okay. Anyway, so last week was, was Easter Sunday, and we explored the idea. We, we really took that theme verse, and we looked at this, this idea of the joy set before Jesus. But if you actually look at the theme verse, it, there's, there's another perspective to it because it indicates this road of challenges, these other things. But it but it's, talks about the incredible thing that waits at the end when we don't let our problems derail us. Over the last few weeks, we've been looking at different parts of Jesus' journey to the resurrection. Last week, we looked at the story of Jesus. We, we started at the last, kind of at the Last Supper, and we went through the, the, the resurrection, talking about the road to joy. And, and now we're going to pick up the story a few days later, after the resurrection, after what we talked about last week. Reading, Let's begin reading in John uh, 21 with verse 15. And it says, After breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, Peter replied. You know I love you. Then feed my lambs, Jesus told him. Jesus repeated the question, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord. Peter said, you know I love you. Then take care of my sheep, Jesus said. A third time he asked him, Simon, son of John. Do you love me? Peter was hurt that Jesus asked the question a third time. He said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, then feed my sheep. 
Now, if you've been with us for the rest of the series, you may be wondering, how do we get from Bethany and, and, the, and the dinner and the anointing there through the parade into the city and, and then with the cursing of the fig tree and the Last Supper and the resurrection, how do we end up, how do we end up here? I'm so glad that you asked that question. And, now, and if you want to, if you miss some of those other messages, you can go back and you can watch them and, and listen to them on our, on, on our website or on our Facebook page or on our YouTube channel. Uh, anyway, last week I mentioned that, that at the Last Supper, Peter told, or Jesus told Peter, you're going to deny me three times. And then when Jesus was involved in that illegal trial that took place at, the, at, at Caiaphas' house and, and, and the courtyard was full of people, but those, most of those people, they'd kind of been gathered by the priests and by, the, by, the, by these uh, religious leaders to support the cause. But, but the Bible tells us that John and Peter, they, got, they slipped in the door, they slipped in and they were in the crowd. And while they were there, somebody rec- recognized Peter and they said, are you one of Jesus' disciples? And three times he said, oh, no, 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 no. And if you continue reading the story, you realize that Peter's absent during the crucifixion. He's not there. Guys, often when we make a mistake or when we're having trouble in our life, and it causes shame. And shame of our mistake causes us to pull back and pull away from others. Isolation is never a safe place in tough times. There's a difference in in isolation and solitude. Rachel's an introvert. After times when we've been with lots and lots of people and big crowds, and she needs some solitude. She even tells me, go find something to do. (laughs) That's just the way it works, okay? I mean, because solitude rejuvenates her. Vacations, what are they? They're opportunities to pull away and just rest, get out of the hustle and bustle, get into a little solitude. It's healthy, but isolation, mm, isolation could be detrimental. Isolation is tough. I mean, look, what do we do? How do we use isolation? We put kid in the corner. We isolate them. We send them to their room. We isolate them. Prisoners who get out of line, and they go into isolation because isolation is hard. We need people. When we make a mistake, when we're going through a tough time, It's not the time we need to be alone. But that's the temptation, isn't it? That's that's the tempting thing because it's just, I'd rather not. Shame and embarrassment and anger, these things make us want to get away from people. When that's not what's the healthiest thing for us. Now, the good news in our story is that Peter, he, he didn't really do that. Because in John 20, the, the, you know, the women go to the, they go to the tomb three days later, and they're going to take care of the body, and they find Jesus is gone. And then they run and find the disciples and tell them, and you know what? They, they say that they talk to Peter and John. That's pretty cool. He pulled away, but he didn't stay away. When we, when we view something as, as a mistake or, or we're having some kind of trouble and, we, and, and that we're in that tension of wanting to pull away, you know, one of the, one of the things we do is we we'll often lash out at people and we, we, we get angry and we chew them out and we do these things and because we're trying to isolate ourselves. But in our favorite stories, our favorite movies, the heroes really never... Find the answer all by themselves. Because we need people. Isolation, going off on our own to hide or try and fix something, it's just not something that really works in the long term. God, and this road, this road less traveled, It's not a road of isolation. 
It's a place of connection. It's me saying, I don't want to be with people, but I choose to because I know it's right and it's healthy and it's good. If we want to be overcomers, then we really should not isolate ourselves. I mean, it's hard to know if you overcome if you're by yourself, isn't it? Now, now that's not to say that it's that a moment of solitude. Guys, it's not saying that it's, it's not okay to step back, catch your breath, order your thoughts. But, but, but the point is that overcoming says we cannot remain disengaged. We can't. And, it, and in the Gospels, we see that Peter, he ran away when he realized he had done just what Jesus said he was going to do. But when the sh- women show up at the tomb, there he is. He had stepped away, but he had stayed connected. I, you know, often in the church, it's so common in the church. People, they say, well, I, I messed up. I just, I, I just, I, I was a... You know, I, I'm trying to follow Jesus, and I did something that I know Jesus doesn't want. So what's one of the first things people do? Well, okay, I just step away from church. And disconnection is never the answer. And if we go back to our story, after hearing the tomb's empty, you know, Peter and John, they take off running to the tomb. And, and John, he's a little more timid. He gets there. He's faster, but he's a little more timid. He gets there and he peeks inside. It does look empty. But Peter, no, there's nothing timid about him. Get out of the way. I'm going inside. He goes right on in there. He gets right inside to to see that. Guys, when we're overcoming mistakes, when we're overcoming challenges, you know what what Peter's showing us is we got to get back into the game. It's not just about being with people, but it's about getting in the game. What's the old adage? When you fall off your bike, get right back on. Get on. Learning a bike when you're little is not easy. Take the training wheels off. It usually leads to more than one scraped knee. Most of us fall multiple times. It's just true. Now, in our home, Rachel had to teach our kids to ride their bike. I couldn't do it. In this week's episode of Confessions from Pastor Tim, (laughs) I wasn't patient at all. When they would start whining about the possibility of falling, I'd say, get over it. And if they wanted to cry and not try, they got scared, I'd say, push your bike back to the house. I wasn't putting up with it. I was the tough love guy. But I was so tough that when I look back on those memories, they're not happy memories because we don't remember dad out there celebrating riding the bike and pushing the bike like you see in the movies. You see dad hollering and screaming and the kids crying because I blew it. Now, if you're a young parent, don't waste the moment that I wasted. Don't. You know, parents, as, as we look back, all of us, we're going to look back on life and, and we're going to look back on our parenting and there's going to be, every one of us have a moment where we're ashamed of it, where there's sorrow, someplace where we, where we feel like we failed our kids. We all have them and we can't go back and change them. I, I wish I could go back and say, let's start this all over. But now my kids are in their 20s, and if they can't ride a bike now, it's their own fault. <clears throat> but what do I do? I have to get back on the bike. I have to do my best going forward. In my case, you know, the, the truth is, I didn't recognize the hardness with which I treated my kids and, and, until Caleb was a teenager. So, so when I look back, I mean, there are good memories, but I've got 15 or so years of me losing my cool and moments where I just screwed up as a parent. But I can choose to dwell on that and let it, 
that memory fester and define me until I'm angry at myself all the time, which ends up making me angry at everybody else. I can get trapped by my shame, or I can say, I'm going to do better. I can realize my kids have more life to live, and I can do better today than I did yesterday, which has been the journey I've tried to be on for the last decade or so. You know, overcoming, it, what it really means is getting back into the game when it's hard, when it's not comfortable. And, and I love the fact that Jesus doesn't waste these moments in our life because it seems, okay, Peter denied him, he runs to the tomb, and he sees him in the room, Jesus is talking, and then he falls right back off the bike again. Because what he does is he says, hey guys, let's go fishing. Because when Jesus met Peter, he asked him to lay down his fishing nets and become a fisher of men. We read that. If you were reading along with us, we read that in Mark chapter 1 uh, this week. Now, if, if you're new or you don't know this, we're, uh, <clears throat> we're taking time this spring as a church to read through the Bible together. We're reading five chapters a week. And, and Rachel and I like to read ours Monday, one a day, Monday through Friday. But you can read them however you want. Um, and I encourage you to read with us. It's just something cool about God speaking to us all about the same thing. Starting tomorrow, we've got... Mark 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. So we're, going to, we're continuing reading Mark now. So we're reading Mark 3 through 7. Um, and anyway, so Mark 1, we read, Jesus said, put your nets down. And chapter 21 of John begins with Peter saying, hey, guys, let's go fishing. Now, now there's nothing wrong with fishing. I love wetting a hook every once in a while. But they weren't going out with a rod and reel to chit-chat and have some good time and catch a couple fish. They're getting in a boat. They got a big net. They're trying to catch a bunch of fish to the market. He went back to the old thing. And those dudes fished all night and didn't catch a blasted thing. Man, oh, man. The sun's coming up, and there's some fella over on the shore, and he starts hollering at him, Hey, did you catch anything? And they go, No, not a thing. He said, throw you down on the other side. And they go, why not? What's one more? And man, the net's crazy full. The Bible says that they were unable to haul it because of the large number of fish. Now, John figures out it's Jesus. They're fighting that net. And he goes, Peter, that's got to be Jesus over there. Whew. And Peter doesn't waste any time. He goes, really? Y'all can fight this net yourself. And he jumps in the water and swims ashore. Just to see Jesus. That's really cool. Here, here, here's what's really cool about this. When we blow it, whether it's at home or at work or at school or with Jesus, most of us want a chance to make it right. That's what we want. And the longer we wait to seize an opportunity to make it right, the harder it is. We need to get that. That's really important. The longer we wait to seize an opportunity to make it right, the harder it is. Because you can sweep something under the rug as much as you want, but that doesn't make it go away. It just makes a bump in the carpet. And we rarely forget about it. And it just gets harder and harder to deal with it. And when somebody does lift up the rug and say, what's this? We go, I don't know who put that there. We start, now do we start the blame game? We start denying. I don't know how that got there. But, but I, because of that, I think that's why Jesus says in Matthew 5 that when something happens in a relationship and it goes sideways, Jesus says, deal with matters quickly. Uh, because the longer we wait, the harder it gets. Peter had started looking back. He knew he wasn't going in the direction the Lord had wanted him to go. He knew that he was supposed to be working on how to be a fisher of men, not a fisher for market. But when Jesus showed up, he didn't waste any time. He didn't. He jumped in the water. Guys, on the road less traveled, we deal with things quickly. 
so that we don't have to lug that thing forever. We deal with, Peter gets to shore, and, he, and Jesus already got some fish cooking on the, on the fire. And he says, hey, bring some of those fish up. I mean, wow. So Peter goes, the boat's getting, he goes, waves out in the water and helps them get that up. But, but what's cool is that even though Peter had done the wrong thing, Jesus didn't waste that moment in his life. How cool is that? He wasn't doing what he wanted, but the Lord says, I'm going to redeem that. That's what's cool is that Jesus can redeem our mistakes. He can redeem our problems. Carrie mentioned it earlier. He can turn our mistakes around. I don't understand how he does it. I love singing these songs about the... Yeah. I don't understand how he does it. But he does it. So if you go back to the story, after breakfast, Jesus is talking to Peter. And he has the conversation that we read in John 21. And it's important we remember, Peter denied Jesus three times. And in this moment, Jesus asked Peter, do you love me? Three times. Now, Peter had denied Jesus. Now, they're sitting at the table, and Jesus goes, you're going to deny me three times. And they're all going, oh, we'll see. But then Peter denies him in, in a place where only maybe John would have seen him. And Jesus chooses to facilitate this restorative moment in front of those guys again. See, the, the road less traveled, it's a road that doesn't disconnect us from those that love us and support us when we blow it. It's a road of trying again and again. It's a place where we don't waste time. And it's a road where we take ownership of our errors, of our problems, of our challenges. As part of overcoming Our fear and being honest with our, those things, our fear of being honest with, with others. Now, you know, over 10 years ago, I was asked to leave a ministry position. Um, truth is, I was essentially fired. For a lot of reasons, when, when it happened, we didn't talk about it much publicly. And when we did, we, you know, if you weren't in the know, we painted kind of a rosy picture for this ministry transition in our life. Uh, boil it down. I blew it because I was too hard and I got an attitude issue. And my family had to suffer the consequences of it. You know, in, in AA and in Teen Challenge, one of the first things you have to do is admit that you have a problem. Now, now that, that's, not so, that's not about broadcasting, hey, look at me, I'm so screwed up. Oh, no, 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 it's not that. It's, a, it's, it's not about bringing attention to ourselves. It's about being honest with ourselves. And it's not about being honest with those that are right around us, that love us and support us and care for us. The road less traveled is a place where we're honest about our faults. It's a place where we, are, we have to show humility and say, this is, this is messed up and I'm right in the middle of it. On the road less traveled, we're not ashamed that we're humans and that we're broken. I mean, it really, it, it, it's that road that leads us, it, it, it's, that, it's the road that leads us to humility and understanding partly that this is just part of the journey. And, uh, remember what the, what the farmer told me? Remember what he said? The only way to not make mistakes is to do nothing. When we can be honest with ourselves, when we can be honest with others, then what we're really doing is revealing our brokenness. In that honesty, that's when we find the humility to ask for help. Being honest with ourselves about our humanity is actually where we recognize our need for Jesus. It's 
where we recognize our need for people and others that love us. When Peter's talking to Jesus, Jesus asks him, he says, Peter, do you love me? And Peter responds with, you know that I love you. You know it. I think Jesus' reply here is so interesting. Because the first time he says, Peter, feed my lambs. The next time he says, take care of my sheep. And after that he says, feed my sheep. Now, now Peter has spent his lifetime thinking about fish. Right? Jesus meets him on the shore and says, leave your fishing. Okay, because I'm going to make you a fisher of men. Oh, okay. He's still talking fish. And there's no indication ever that Jesus doesn't say, I want you to be a fisher of men. But I'm going to add a new idea to this. An idea of tending sheep. He, what he, Jesus was saying was, you're going to have to look at this differently. You need a different perspective. When we're setting things right after we blow it, guys, after we're facing a challenge, you know, we have to, what, what really comes down to is we need to ask ourselves, what am I willing to do differently to keep from making the same mistake again? What am I willing to do differently? After that uh, ministry failure, I got a couple of mentors in my life. Started, I went to some training. I started practicing being a better listener. Started practicing talking to people nicer. Helped in my home. Helped with my children. And it actually put me on a road of ministry that brought me to Crossing Place. The good news in our story is that Peter, if you continue reading, he goes on to be the leader of the church in Jerusalem after Jesus leaves. I mean, wow. But to get there, he had to change his perspective. He had to change his behaviors. When I look at Peter's story, I find it interesting that Jesus told him, you're going to deny me. Jesus knew ahead of time. He could have stopped him. He could have said, all right, I know what's going to happen if you're in the garden with me tonight, so I need you to go back to Bethany and spend the night with Lazarus. He could have done any number of things to remove Peter from the situation. So it did happen. Why didn't he do it? Why doesn't God remove us from those moments? Well, I think the Bible answers the question and, 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 and with, with a couple of real clear things. One, and most importantly, is that God is not in the habit of creating robots. We're not puppets that he's manipulating. I want this person to suffer a loss, and I want this person to be blessed. We're not puppets that he's manipulating. No, see, the Lord doesn't force us. He gives us options. He gives us choices. Throughout the Bible, the Lord tells people, choose. You can find in the, as you read the Bible where the Lord has said to people, this is what you should choose. There's other places where he says, ah, don't choose that. And you also find in the story, reading about David, reading about Moses, reading about all the different people where they made choices. Some of them made the right choice. And some of them, like the Nazi on, in, in the Indiana Jones movie, he heard him say, you have chosen poorly. All right, that was a, a movie reference that didn't go there. So take that out of the notes, right? <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, Joshua even famously says, to talk to, to the people, he says, who are you going to choose to serve? He says, I don't know about you, but me and my family, we're going to choose the Lord. We get a choice. <clears throat> See, the main thing in this is that the Lord can control us. He could do that. But his choice is to let us choose. 
He could force us to love him, but then that's not real love, is it? If Jesus had removed Peter from the situation so that he would not have the opportunity to deny him, he would also have been stealing the opportunity for Peter, for Peter to say, I blew it, but I'm coming back because I still love you. Now, the second reason that I think the Lord doesn't puppetize and that he didn't remove him from that is wrapped up in in what he said to Isaiah where he said, my ways are just higher than your ways. You know, I was, when I was a young pastor, a young minister, I you know, you get this whole thing about you give the altar call and you want all everybody to everybody to respond. And I had this old, old preacher say to me, he said, son, what you think is the end is sometimes God's beginning. If, if Jesus had done something to circumvent Peter's denial, would Peter have been broken enough and become humble enough to lead the church in Acts? Would he have had the humility to walk away from all those Jewish Christians and go to the Gentiles in Acts chapter 10? Was, was Jesus seeing something bigger? Overcoming the uh-ohs in our life in a healthy way, they seem to best be accomplished when we believe that God's trustworthy. When we believe that he's at work even when things are are the darkest for us. I said it earlier. Overcome, part of overcoming is believing that Jesus can redeem our mistakes and our challenges and our problems. He can redeem the things that have gone wrong. And that redemption often takes shape, takes the shape of us having to do something different. Like Peter, we, we can't just hold on to the same perspective. When, when I stay engaged with, with the people who love me and the people who've been affected by, by whatever it is I'm involved in, and I deal with it in a timely fashion, it usually leads to the place where I have to acknowledge that something's happened, right? A confession, a, a, a moment of humility. It's that place of honesty. But I can do all those things. But really overcoming eventually leads to a place where I have to do something different. I have to think differently. I'll be right back where I am. Overcoming requires me to make that shift. Like Peter did. Carrie, would you join me? Can you play healer? <clears throat> Michelle, would you come back to Guys, we're humans. Life's tough. We're going to talk about that in the next series. We, we, storms happen. We make mistakes. We, we, we face things that are unexpected. And I would imagine that today, some of you have been thinking about, as I've talked about this, you've thought about some of the whoops in your own world. Maybe a fresh one that just happened. Maybe one that you never dealt with. Maybe one you hadn't thought about in a long time. Maybe you thought about the new behavior that you've avoided. The new perspective that you've pushed down. Now I will say this, that over the years I, I know that there are some things I buried so long ago that I 
couldn't dig them up and I couldn't repair them. There's no way I can make it right today. But it doesn't stop me from having a moment of honesty with myself and facing that thing and saying, if I make a change, it never has to happen again. You know, what's the old saying? Better late than never. The process of the road less traveled leads to a moment where we're confronted by our actions and we, we have to decide, am I willing to change? Am I willing to make the shift? I mean, in almost 31 years of marriage, I've hurt this woman too many times. Some intentional, some unintentional. And I've tried to make changes. And I'm not done. Because I know that there are more hurts ahead. And I'm going to have to make more changes. If I don't want to keep doing the same thing. And if you're here today. And you know that there's some struggle you're facing. And, and you, you know that there's a new behavior and even especially one that Jesus has been speaking to you about and you've been struggling because I don't want that new perspective. I don't want to change my behavior and you're struggling with that. Then I want to pray for you today. You know, many people struggle following Jesus because they, they, they think, I, I, I just keep slipping up. I, keep, I, can't, I can't do it. I can't do it. I can't do it. I can't do it. So what do they do? I said it earlier. They isolate themselves from the church. They isolate themselves from other Christians. They think they can't do the Christian thing, so they just stop trying. Essentially, they struggle with the new perspective that Jesus is trying to show them and teach them. Now, if you're here today and, and you're struggling with your relationship with Jesus because you feel like you've just messed up too many times, then I want you to hear what I'm fixing to say. In a matter of days, Peter denied Jesus three times, then went right back to the thing that Jesus told him not to do, and yet Jesus still called to him. Jesus didn't stop loving him. Jesus didn't say, I'm done with you. Jesus did not say, I don't need you anymore. And I'm willing to bet that in this room or those watching online, that very few, if any of you, have ever denied Jesus three times and then immediately gone back and did what he told you not to do. But if Jesus was lovingly pursuing Peter, then I can promise you that today he's lovingly pursuing you. You've not messed up too much. Jesus still loves you, and he's still calling you today. And if you need to come to Jesus, or maybe you pulled a Peter and you went towards the thing Jesus told you not to, and you need to come back to Jesus, today would be a great day for that. Oh, be a great day. He wants to restore you and love you. You just have to stop and be honest with yourself and honest with Him. Acknowledge it. what our song said. You're what I need. You're what I need. He wants to redeem. And I don't know how he'll do it. I don't know how he does it. But will we trust him? Will you trust him to find out? Will you trust him to find out today? Will everyone bow your heads. Now, if you're watching online today and, and you would like to become a follower of Jesus and want this to encounter this redemption, would you do me a favor and go down to the comment section and type in the word choosing Jesus so that we know how to pray for you. 
And if you're here in the room and you want to begin following Jesus for the first time, or maybe come back because you went the wrong way, then I want to pray for you and I want to ask you to do me a favor, not to embarrass you, but just so I know who I'm praying for. Would you, would you just wave at me? Would you look up, make eye contact with me just so I know who I'm praying for today in the room? Who's looking for this redemption moment? Now, if you're here today and you're a follower of Jesus, and you're struggling with some behavior, as you say, I keep falling into this same trap, and I know Jesus is asking me to do something different, and you've been struggling with that. <coughs> And I want to pray for you too. And, and if that's you, I'm not embarrassed, but I just want to know who I'm praying for. Would you just wave at me, make eye contact with me? Yeah. Yeah. Just so I know who I'm praying for. Yes, Jesus. Father, I thank you that you love us. I thank you that you are trustworthy and you are the redeemer and Lord for those today who are choosing to follow you or come to you <laughs> oh my Jesus King I ask that you wrap your loving arms around them let them know that you've been pursuing them like you pursued Peter. That you love them just like you loved him. That, they, that there is no too far away. That redemption is waiting in this relationship. In this community moment. In this connection moment. Lord, for those here who say, I, Pastor Tim, I've uh, been been facing some things, I've struggled with some things, I, I, I end up in the same place, and I know Jesus has been speaking to me about making a shift, there's, some, there's a different behavior, and I just haven't, haven't really wanted to, or haven't been able to break over and get committed, whatever it is, but I've struggled with it, and today I say, I want to acknowledge that. Lord, you saw that acknowledgement. And, in those, and, and Lord, so in that, I pray that you would release your love and your confidence. And Lord, I pray for the redemptive process of connection and staying at it, staying in the game, of, of, of being quick and honest and humble. reaching for that new thing even though it's hard because you love us and you're trying to redeem us Lord pray for that across this body that it would be part of who we are Lord that we would be a people that travel and stay on this road it's less traveled. And we would invite others onto the road with us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Would you sing the chorus? Let's just, you can stay seated.
healer, our provider, our redeemer. And we ask you, redeem physically, redeem emotionally, redeem spiritually. Lord, today, redeem families, redeem jobs, redeem careers, redeem broken relationships, redeem dreams. Redeem callings. Redeem our lives, Lord. Amen. Amen. Now, for those of you that chose today to begin the to begin following Jesus, I want to ask you to favor, would you take 60 seconds and, and with Pastor Darlene, Rachel, myself, Carrie, Amos, or Michelle, and just take 60 seconds and just tell us how I made that choice today so that we can per- privately, we want to celebrate with you. And we just want to celebrate that moment and with you. If you're struggling with a new behavior and you say, I, Pastor Tim, I, I, I need somebody to talk to about that. Well, don't hesitate to call us. Because we'd love to talk with you if, if that would help in your redemption process. We would love to do that. Um, this week, we're continuing to read Matthew, uh, Mark, so Mark 3 through 7. Don't forget about Wednesday nights as we pray this week. Invite your unchurched friends next week as we begin series storms and talk about the storms of life guys we love you have a great week and choose to walk the road less traveled be blessed